Have you ever wondered, what do these people know that I don't know? How do I do it? How do I find my purpose, my passions? What if you could sit down with some of the wisest experts, everyday leaders, and inspirational people who could answer your deepest questions? That is what we do here on the Inspirational Living Podcast. We invite you to join us as we hold conversations, share wisdom, tips, and tools to inspire you, ignite your passions and vision for your life, to awaken your sense of purpose and hope, and leave you inspired to design your best life. Join me, your host, psychologist Dr. Sean Horn, as we take you on an inspirational, motivational, and educational journey so you can inspire by living an inspired life. Welcome, everyone, to today's show. I am so excited about our guest today. We are with Lindsay, the founder of Alive and Awake. She is a transformational leadership expert, international speaker, master coach to global game changers, TEDx speaker, HuffPost blogger, and author of The Path of the Unicorn, and as I mentioned, the founder of Alive and Awake. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And I am, I'm more excited. I just have to tell you, let me tell you guys how I met Lindsay, because it was really at a critical, pivotal point in my life where it was about two years ago and I was recovering from a trauma, a family trauma that occurred. And I was on Facebook and I was watching somebody talk about going to this event. They called it the bliss event. And I didn't know what bliss was. I didn't know what they did. But inside of me, I just heard this voice that said, go. And it was so firm and it was so directive. And there was no question I was meant to go. So I just bought, I I thought, okay, I'm going. And someone had a ticket available. I bought it. And five days later, I'm on the plane to Orange County and I'm showing up at this bliss event of which Lindsay was one of the speakers and one of the workshop leaders there at the event and was actually the first workshop that I encountered when I was there. Now, when I showed up, here I am in my late 40s. I had been a psychologist for years and I didn't realize it, but I I was burned out. I was in such a numbed out state. And when I was there, I experienced reactions in me and triggers in me of just incredible discomfort, which was really surprising to me because I thought, why am I so uncomfortable like hugging people and talking about uh, how I feel? And I realized I was hiding behind the role of being a guru, so to speak, like I will be your helper. I will hold space for you so that you don't have to hold my space because I don't want to go there and talk about it. Right. (laughs) And so when I showed up, Lindsay is a yoga instructor, yoga, what do you call it? Yoga master or? Um, Yeah, no, I wouldn't call him a master, but I I include movement as one of my modalities. So I'm a trained yoga teacher, but I I, I don't have an identity as being a yoga teacher, but it's definitely a very pivotal movement in the yogic philosophy. I'm forever a student of and and also a a teacher of and a sharer of the wisdom uh, when I'm asked. And that you did. You were in this room with the room full of women, having them connect with their bodies and connecting that moment. And when I got in that room, I set my mat up and I had enough space around me to put vehicles between me and everybody else. And all of a sudden someone came in, they pulled their mats right against my mat and they said, oh no, we're going to get real comfortable. And I was like, "Like I don't want to do this. And so that was the beginning of a, a lot of di- uncomfortable moments. But at the end of it, I had this huge huge shift that I cannot put words on. I really cannot. It was like this veil came off of me and I was like, oh, hello, Sean. There you are. Where have you been? And I felt alive and awake. And I came back and I was a transformed person. I mean, radically transformed. And I decided, why did I abandon my gifts, my purpose, my calling? 
And I decided I wasn't going to do that, that I was going to step into inspired action and begin. And for those that have been watching my journey before this two years ago, and all that has happened in two years, it's been close to a miracle, like shocking what has happened. And this podcast is one of the fruits of that. So I am so excited because you were part of that process for me. You were an instrument that was used for my own personal transformation. And my daughters, who, by the way, my daughter, Sarah, absolutely adores you. And, and, and you've connected with my cousin who comes down to your retreat center in Costa Rica and had an opportunity to go down there and do some surfing lessons and body work and so forth. So I am excited to have this conversation with you today about being alive and awake, about stepping into inspired action for a purpose-driven, passion-fueled life. So share with us, Lindsay, your, your take on what is this alive and awake concept? that you are speaking on. First of all, thank you for that incredible story and mirror of, I didn't know any of this before this very moment. I mean, I felt this deep connection with you, but the story of the, the impact that that very first session and that weekend had, my heart is bursting. So I'm actually at a loss, uh, a loss thank for you. words right now. And just in such a state of love for you and oh, humility you. for the power of this work that we are blessed to do, which is, it's in my opinion, just really about being human and Yes. being in a state of love towards all the other humans we come into contact with in yes. whatever roles we're asked to play, right? Yes, it is. So, sacred space. This healing space is amazing. Sacred space. So I'm, mm. I'm in deepest gratitude to you for sharing that yeah. story and for your own journey. I'm in awe of your journey and your courage and the example you are of being alive and awake and uh, we'll maybe borrow your story as a case study for what I believe being alive and awake is all about. You hit on so many of the key themes that I talk about that are very much a mirror of my experience as well and the more people that I speak to, um, like you, I've had the privilege and the blessing of hearing thousands of people's stories yes. over the years and holding space and, and it's it, the more people I speak to, the more I understand that we're all so much alike, so much more yes. alike than we are different. And the universe yes. is true to all of our journeys, regardless of what the external circumstances may look like. Very much like you, I had an experience of feeling very burnt out. Mm -hmm. And early on in my career, in my sort of early to mid 20s was my first experience of burnout. I was working in a very elite management consulting role and had just graduated from an elite business school. And I think you and I align in the sense of, of having these very um, driven personalities and the capacity, the desire for and the capacity to create. Um, in, yes. In an accelerated we can't help it. We just have to do it. We just have to. Which is a blessing and a curse, as you know. <laughs> and so that was my first experience of, of feeling numb and empty, even though on the outside, my life looked picture perfect. There was no Instagram in those days, but it would have looked Instagram perfect. Yes. And, um, but feeling numb, empty, anxious inside and realizing that in many ways I was living a lie because the facade of my life was in no way reflective of how I felt inside and really in no way reflective of what my core values were what I felt like I was meant to be doing on the planet, which at that time I had no idea what that was. So it's not like I was like, yes. oh, I'm not doing this thing over here. I was like, I don't know what that thing is, but I definitely know it's not this. Yes. And so that idea, I call it of being the walking dead is you see it often people walking down the streets that they've lost that spark in their eyes. The sparkle is gone. And that feeling maybe some people can relate to of going through the motions, almost like being on a hamster wheel of you get up, you go to work, you take the kids, you do the things, you go grocery shopping. So going through the motions of life, but not really living. Yes. And I think that so many people default, and I was very much of this path of just checking off the boxes of what we think we should do without ever even questioning or examining whether or not that's our truth, whether we desire those things. In my case, it was very much driven by deep, deep chronic anxiety that I, you know, dealt with since I was a young child for various different reasons. And my way of, of coping was through overachievement and perfectionism to try to control as many of the external circumstances of my life as I could to mask the feeling of total lack of control and terror I was feeling on the inside. 
I, that would be the opposite of what I think being alive and awake is. That was yeah. sort of <laughs> and you don't even know that you're not. Like you mentioned, I was living a lie, but it, we don't realize it. We bought into this message that this is what you should do to have a successful life, to be responsible and to be fulfilled. And so we just follow suit and do those things. Exactly. Exactly. I remember I learned a prayer. I'm not overly religious at all. My family grew up in a United Church of Canada, which I joke is like the chicken soup for the soul religion. There's like oh. <laughs> not very much mention of the Bible or any of that. They're just like, just be a good human and do your best. <laughs> Everything else is cool. But I remember I, I learned this prayer as a little girl. It was like, now I lay me down to sleep. And part of the prayer, I was like, well, help me to be a good girl. And that oh, languaging yes. got so imprinted. And then I defaulted in my family of origin to, as the oldest child to being the good girl and the perfect child and the overachiever. And I look back on it now. And I think as I you know, guide my, my kids through different mantra and different life lessons, is now I would say, please help me to live my truth. Which wow, that's an powerful. Entirely different thing than being a good girl. I nailed the game of being a good girl. Yeah, no I, more nice girl. No, we are I, an inspired girl. Exactly. <laughs> a great cause to myself. So now I would say, please help me to live my truth. Wow. And so when we talk about being alive and awake, for me, it's, it's about living in truth with a capital T mm. and knowing that there are always many versions of the truth. There's my truth, there's your truth, there's the actual circumstantial truth, the underlying truth, and not only that, the version of our truth changes over time. It's not static. It's always evolving and changing. So how I felt last year may not be how I feel this year or how I was a mother 10 years ago may not be how I want a mother now or how I built my career or how I love or any of those things. So to be in alive and awake for me is very much about being present to where am I now? What's my truth in this moment? And looking at sometimes the inconvenient, ugly truth of our lives, of realizing, oh no, this is not where I want to be. This is not working for me. And so uh, sometimes in a lot of this transformational work, it comes off as like rainbows and unicorns and positive affirmations and bumper stickers with just be happy. Don't worry, be happy. That is not what I stand for. That is not... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what yeah. being alive and awake is all about. For me, it's about truth, which often looks like feeling a lot of feelings, as you alluded to, mm -hmm. that, that would fall on, on the more painful side of the spectrum or the less comfortable yes. side of the spectrum. I say a life pursuit where people are pursuing happiness, it's like having a diet of sugar 24-7. We are not intended to be in this happy state 24-7. Mm -hmm. I want to pursue peace. I want to pursue wisdom. And to be in that place, it's being at peace with all, with all the truth, with the positive, the negative. But what I'm hearing you say is that the truth you're speaking of, it almost sounds like an inspired truth from our spiritual self, from our, our soul, from our intuition, from those nudges we hear inside and really honoring that and living congruently with that and then moving forward from that place. But a lot of times we find that through the pain, right? And that's that ugly truth that we want to push through. And that's what I'm hearing you talk about. 100%. And I am deeply, deeply inspired by the, the ancient wisdom traditions, because as you mentioned, I have been immersed in, in the study of those, uh, specifically around yoga and Buddhism for over 25 years now. And, and the word they use is contentment. And I really oh, like I that like word that. or mm -hmm. equanimity. That state of mm. peace, as you mentioned, about being at peace in stillness, regardless of what's happening around us. One of the ways to get to that point of stillness, of peace, of contentment, of joy in a, in a very pure sense of the word, for me, is about confronting the shattering moments, the pain, the dark night of the soul, as we hear about it discussed in the hero's journey, you know, in any kind of beautiful mythological stories. And so I believe that the direct route to these places of truth and freedom and peace and love is through directly through our pain and directly stepping into those things we are most uncomfortable with feeling, seeing, experiencing, but doing it with, with a real attitude of curiosity, 
of humility, of trying to gain better understanding of compassion. So we know Viktor Frankl, who's one of my iconic heroes, talks about making meaning out of our suffering. So it's not to revisit our pain for the sake of rumination or of you know, reliving it and re-traumatizing ourselves over and over again. Instead, it's for the sake of feeling the unexpressed feelings that may have never been allowed to be felt, which I'm a huge advocate for, and I imagine you are as well. Mm -hmm. And they uh, say, if you name it, you can tame it. If you name it, you can tame it. So it's giving it a voice, letting it come out in that way. Yes. And and I would add to that, feel it to free it. Oh, I like that. I know. I just came up with that right now. I'm like, that is exactly it. You got to feel it to free it. Because if you don't allow the energy of that emotion to flow through you, it remains forever trapped in our bodies. And that's how we know. People call it stress, right? All the medical research about heart diseases, cancers, mental health issues, autoimmune diseases, directly linked to stress. And I think if we dig a level deeper, a lot of the causes of stress are unexpressed emotions. Mm -hmm. We suppress, we repress, we try to avoid feeling certain things. It spikes our cortisol levels, all the Mm -hmm. things that go on, the inflammatory responses of our bodies. And so when I talk about stepping into the shadows, the shadow work, for me, again, it's not this like masochistic thing to just go in and, and keep you know, revisiting pain, it's in the spirit of witnessing our own journeys, of witnessing our our former selves, our inner children, our our wounded selves with love and compassion, and probably other people as well that were involved in those Mm -hmm. scenarios that in, in the drama of life that caused us pain for the sake of transmutation of, again, whether it's simply understanding or forgiveness or compassion or wisdom of knowing, okay, contrast situations. When I know what I don't want, I know what I do want. I know I don't want to be treated that way. Therefore, I'm going to practice speaking my truth or setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. Or I know that I don't want to live in resentment my whole life. Therefore, I'm going to practice forgiveness, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. That's for me, the path to going from the walking dead inevitably involves going through the idea of the, the, the valley of darkness. But for me, I, I imagine I love to scuba dive. So mm-hmm. I like to bring a playful attitude. I imagine it more like you're exploring the like cenotes in Mexico, like you're a scuba diver and you're just going in different caves with yes. a flashlight. And you're like, ooh, what's down this way? I haven't gone down this cave before. And if you can bring that sense of playfulness, curiosity, humility, mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't need to be so scary, I think. I l- I love that analogy because in scuba diving, you have tools, you have your tank, you have that flashlight, you have the mask. And a lot of times people are trying to scuba dive without the mask, without the flashlight, then they wonder what's wrong with me. And so what you said was so key about you need to feel it to free it and let it flow. That is a skill set. How do I let it flow out? which is a lot of this mindfulness work that people are doing where they're letting their thoughts and feelings enter the gates of their mind, but they're letting it also pass on versus ruminating on it, like you said. So people, when it comes up, they kind of get stuck with it. Like, what do I do with this? But you've mentioned several key steps, which is to let it speak to you. What does it need? What does it want? What is it trying to say to you? Is it saying don't tolerate intolerable things, take action, change this circumstance? What is it saying? Or are we done shaming and blaming ourselves, (laughs) taking responsibility for parts that aren't ours? And people walk around just like, oh, it's me. And it's like, no, it's not you. And so we maybe need to heal that and release that. But as you work with people like you and and myself and those in the healing profession, you are given that guidance, those tools, those mindset tools and the practices, the meditational practices to manage and help facilitate those thoughts and those feelings. So they're not who you are, but they're something you experience and that story does not define you. It's something you experienced. So how can you turn, like you said, um, Frankel had talked about, turn your, your pain into purpose. And, and so how do you do that? And that's the journey. That, this is the journey. And you're saying walk through that. And we want to be equipped with that process so that you can be birthed anew into the design, who you were designed to be, 
transform into the person you were designed to be, not who you were programmed to be. Yes, 100%. I just have come up with this super simple four-step process that ties together everything you just said that I think is a helpful reminder for people, like what, how do we do this thing? I'm like, yeah, just step into your shadowy, scary feelings. Just go ahead. But I, I can give people a super powerful, but simple framework that I follow and that I'm sharing with people. And the very first part of it, number one is to witness and feel. I want to underline what you said about being the witness of our emotions that the ancient wisdom traditions talk about witness consciousness. Mm -hmm. So being in this place, but not of this place. And, and one of the ways that we do that, as you already mentioned, is name it to tame it. So a simple tool of simply naming anxiety, fear, nervousness, joy, happiness, excitement, and starting to be able to just simply name the emotional states that we're feeling. And I say, it's like you're a scientist with a clipboard. You're not clinging on to some feelings and trying to avoid the others because you're just observing. You're just taking notes of like, because we know that with emotions or feelings, they're easy come, easy go. If you don't cling on to something and start to uh, either again, cling to it or try to avoid it, chances are, if you're really just present in each moment, if you refocus your attention, it'll be gone before you know it, or at least quicker than if we, if we cling to it. So witness and feel, and some of the ways to do that are journaling talking it out with a trusted therapist or a coach or somebody, um, feeling it out. I'm a huge proponent of movement because I think a lot of the healing work tends to happen for me, at least in the cognitive space, in the spiritual realms, which is all very heady. And we can get pretty far with that. And then we add in the emotional body and we're getting, we're getting there. But what we often forget about is the physical embodiment and the opportunity to use our bodies to move the energy of emotion, to dance something out, to go for a walk or a run or a horseback ride or a surf and allow the emotion to just move through us. Again, as opposed to sitting there and trying to overanalyze it. And sometimes when we get a few tools up our sleeves, it's a bad thing because we're like, oh, I know why this is happening. It's because when I was a child, that thing happened and we get all analytical about it. But really often what we need to do is just feel it. And yes. beyond a certain level of understanding, of course, I think that's super important, but I think there's also a time to just feel the feelings about it and not need to intellectualize it and understand why you're feeling. Sometimes we have no idea why we're feeling what we're feeling because it's ancient or it's, it's your grandmother's thing that you somehow inherited and you don't know what the heck it's all about, but you're still feeling something. Yes. So witness the feelings you're feeling as you're feeling them and allow them to move through your body. The second step is acceptance. It is what it is. Now what? is the mantra that I use. As soon as we can accept wherever it is, whether we're feeling lost or stuck or grieving or anxious or bored or any of it in any realm of our lives, that is the direct route to freedom. Because they say that in, again, at the ancient wisdom traditions, the root of all suffering is wishing that things were other than what they are. Resisting. So resisting. And so as soon as we can, and this is, I don't say this lightly, it may take time to get into acceptance, mm -hmm. but if we can, as I use the mantra over and over again, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Now what? This is radical acceptance because you're not radical. talking about it being, you're saying, I approve of that. I mm -hmm. welcome that. It's okay with me. Mm -hmm. You're saying you're coming to this radical acceptance of being able to acknowledge and to sit with the truth that it just is what it is. You can't control it. You can't change it. It just is what it is. And mm -hmm. so you're done fighting that or trying to change it or control it. You like yeah. stop, you lay that shield down and you just say, okay. It's very rooted in surrender. And, and I think surrender and serenity are such powerful. It's that, that idea of getting into true flow with mm -hmm. what is actually happening in our lives, in the flow of mm -hmm. what we're meant to be doing on the planet. And then now what part about it for me is where I get to have agency and take action. It's, I'm not saying it is what it is. I, I give up. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I give, like I drop the tug of war rope so that maybe I can walk away and go down a different path or respond in a different way than resistance or denial or any of the other options. And so the third step of my four step one is making meaning of it, very much inspired by Viktor Frankl. And so the idea is, okay, it is what it is. I'm in this situation. My job is dead. My marriage, my, I've gone through some life experience that is not what I wanted. And so the meaning making process, which I'm obsessed with, and they say is very much having a sense of purpose or making meaning, it's such a, a huge driver of 
enjoyment of life, of engagement in whatever we're doing, and of performance ultimately in whatever it is that we're hoping to create. And the way that I, I the tool that I use for making meaning is I, I invite myself and people that I work with to look for the lessons and the blessings as oh, a I mantra. Like that. Mm-hmm. What are the lessons I'm meant to learn from this? And what are the blessings that I never in a million years would have expected, but that because of this crucible moment, this thing, this crisis time, there are some blessings in disguise. So that immediately starts to help us to not feel trapped as victims of circumstances and stay in that rumination of why me, why is this happening? I can't believe this is happening, which of course there's a time and a place to have those feelings, which is why feeling the feelings is step number one. Uh And then there comes a point to say, okay, what am I meant to learn from this? What are the blessings out of this? And then the final step number four is I call it life as art, which is to use the energy, the inspiration, the truth, the insights and the wisdom of these crucible moments and offer it back out as art, as your creative expression, which could look simply like having a good cry or dancing in your kitchen or journaling in your journal, or it could look like a beautiful connecting conversation with a loved one about your experience or sharing with friends, or, or it could look like just a great dialogue with a, a healer or a coach or somebody that you work with, but it also could look like sharing it on social media for others to benefit. It could look like writing a book. It could look like starting a whole business or a whole practice or creating actual art, you know, painting or music or whatever it is. But uh, when we can use these experiences as creative expression, as well as to be of service out back out into the world. I think that's the ultimate step in the transmutation of offering our pain, taking the darkness and bringing it back to the light, offering it back out in love, in creation, in gratitude, ultimately in gratitude for what has happened to us. Thank you for giving me this experience. You know, I think it was Michael Beckwith who says that. And it's like, would I have wished for it? No. Um, (laughs) Did I want that to happen? No. At the end of the day, can I look back on it and find some beautiful growth, expansion, meaning in why that happened? And, And as I believe it's all divine. I truly, truly believe that every single thing that comes our way is there. It's happening for us, not to us. And so it's my job to get as quickly as I can to the understanding why, you know, what the benefit of it is for me. I heard someone say, instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Ask, what are you doing in this situation for me? Mm-hmm. And so then you can change that mindset. These four steps that you've talked about, they work. They, we know that they work. The field of psychology has, is changing, it's shifting as we are acknowledging that the issues are in the tissues and that we can't always get to a healing place with our head alone and our head can't be separated and severed from our body and so so often people think if I know the why then I can change this and I said well if that's true you wouldn't eat sugar everybody would be fit you know our life would reflect that but that's not the case knowing why does not equate change so we do need to move our body we do need to use these tools so let's like review this real quick I heard you say in the first one you're observing the emotion and you're naming it by describing it. I notice I'm feeling anxious. And the principle with that is you can't see the painting when you're inside the painting. So you have to step out to be able to see it. And by describing it and saying it out loud or writing it or talking to somebody like you mentioned, and I would say somebody who's not going to judge that emotion or try to get you back into headspace by telling you how to fix it but really to hold space for you with empathic understanding. They don't even need to say anything to you. That's why I think it's so great about those 12-step programs is that there isn't that talking back. They just let you speak what your experience and your truth, and that's just that, and it's very healing. So you're, you're using these methods to put it out. And then the second step is... Except I have witness yeah. and feel because I think I just want to add in that there's also it's not just the naming of it, but you because I know people they'll be like, oh, I'm feeling anxious, and I will cue them what's showing up in your body right now, what mm-hmm. like actually feeling the feelings is a super super part important part, and then step number two is acceptance, radically accepting it, yes, and 
When you were talking, I was reminded that what we have discovered in research, that four things need to happen for true transformation to occur. And I actually learned this after the Bliss, the Bliss Project event. I could not explain why I had this, the closest thing to a born-again experience outside of a church, you know, kind of thing. I was like, what is going on? And I went to a trauma training with this man. He was so amazing. He's in Colorado at a center called Evergreen Council. Center and he works with those kids who are orphans, who are feral, who were never touched, who were brought into the United States, and no one can help them. Like it, it's everything I've ever heard about these children in their brain is that it's organic, it, it can't be changed. And this man is transforming these children. I saw it with my own eyes, I was speechless throughout this thing. And he mentioned at the end, he said, four things need to happen for transformation to occur. It needs to be interpersonal. And I was like, oh, so you're with other people. It needs to be emotional. And I'm going, oh, yeah, did that. <laughs> and it needs to be exper experiential to where you're doing an exercise, you're doing a movement of some kind with your body, a, a, a exercise. And and then it needs to be symbolic. And I realized that all four of those components occurred at that training. I was with other people. It was pulling. Those exercises we did forced my body to release whatever was in it that I could not verbalize or my conscious mind couldn't connect with. But it just did it. It just did what it needed to do. You have to trust your body that it will just do what it needs to do. And then when we were all done, we were given this bracelet. We were given this joy of the journey bracelet that I wore forever until it broke. And it, it was just, I had all those components. And then I thought, that's why that happened. And so it's so important to do this piece that you're talking about, the art, the body, the movement to express it. Because I really truly believe that when we're engaged in art and those things, it is it is a time that our spirit kind of opens up and we're able to let that unconscious process occur and we're able to connect with the most core of our being. The closest thing that we had as children where we were just in the moment, out of our head, living, drawing, singing, twirling, dancing, you know, we were in that very genuine place. So when we give ourselves that permission to do that, boom, it opens up again. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. So I love what you had to say and these four steps and the work that you are doing. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And please tell us where people can find you now and find your work and what you're doing. Well, thank you so much. I haven't heard those specific four steps, but they so resonate for me. And I, I am so inspired by you and your work and the depth of your expertise and mastery and, and the size of your heart and your soul is just oh, exquisite thank you. To, to be in the presence of. So thank, thank you for sharing you. all of it. Thank and you. so so where you can find me is at aliveandawake.com. And I am on Instagram as Lindsay Alive. L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, Alive, and both LinkedIn and Facebook at Lindsay Sukornik, S-U-K-O-R-N-Y-K. So thank you so much for, and thank I would love you. to hear from anybody. I love to interact with all the people. So yeah. Yes. Thank you, thank and you tell you us, us real quick, tell us about your retreat center in Costa Rica. Oh, I, I loved what you said because... Um, there's, I was about to get all excited and nerdy about the, the method to the madness of using movement. You mentioned Vanessa, your beautiful, amazing cousin, who I also met at Bliss Project. And so what I've learned over the years is working with lots of genius people that are in their minds a lot is that I joke we need to lose our minds sometimes and get into our bodies. So we use surfing movement, yoga, any kind of movement modality that is striking my fancy as a metaphor. You mentioned, mentioned about the symbolic nature of it. And as I'm either bringing in other teachers or cueing it myself, um, the reason that I do these experiences down in Costa Rica versus the boardrooms and places that I've done them historically is because of the importance, I think, of getting into nature, getting into tribe, into community. Many of the principles you just shared, I realized I could only take people so far in these intimate one-on-one sessions that I was having in in the heart of the city so it's all about exactly what you said creating experiential learning opportunities that really truly integrate 
not only body, mind, spirit, but also nature, which is very much connected to spirit. And then using all the different adventure activities like stand up paddle boarding or surfing or yoga or uh, contemporary movement practices, whatever it may be to help people really plug into their healing and then ultimately figuring out through their healing processes what their truth is in this moment and then helping them to relaunch into what's next for them. Yes, Vanessa shared with me a story of hiking up a waterfall when she was at your retreat and just a a transformational experience she had in that exercise. And it is so true. There is only so much we can do one-on-one, but to have that level of transformation, it only occurs in the context of a group. And it makes sense to me why people have it in whether it's a 12-step program or it's it's a, a spiritual organization or it's a social event those places and those spaces that are created for us can allow us to go to a next level that wouldn't be possible alone. We need each other. We really need each other. So thank you, Lindsay. I need you, girl. And I'm so glad you're in my life. You are just a gift and a blessing and a sparkle of joy, inspiring hope, inspiring people to find their purpose and their passion to live a fueled life. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. I hope this discussion was inspiring and uplifting to your journey. Please remember this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not meant to substitute a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Also, make sure you rate this show, share with those you know, and send us a shout out. Please message me with any topics you would like me to address or questions you have on social media at Dr. Sean Horn or on my website. Thank you again and may you find joy in the journey and be richly blessed.